Thank you, everyone. The story I'm going to tell uh, today started in 1999. So were you all around in 1999? Yeah. Most of you were pretty small then. Uh, I was 41 then, so if you're good at math, you can figure some things out. Um, and in 1999, I was a biology professor at Texas Tech University in the United States. And um, I was living the normal professor life. And you may not think professors are very normal, but we do our thing. And I decided I needed to take a week off of being a professor and have a vacation. So that summer, I went and spent one week of holiday in Jamaica, which is a beautiful island in the Caribbean Sea. And my plan was basically I was going to sit on the beach, swim on the shore, and get very tan. And I was going to drink red striped beer and some Jamaican rum while listening to reggae music. And I did that for several days, and it was great fun. But then something happened. I had a chance encounter, which led to me making a decision, which changed the course of my life. I literally made a step that took me now to being in Hong Kong. So I want to tell you about that today. Um, I'm a big sports fan. So in 1999, the um, NBA basketball championships were between the New York Knicks and the San Antonio Spurs. I'm a Laker fan, so I really didn't care about any of those too much, but, <laughs> um, but that's OK. Um, so I was at the hotel in Jamaica, and the game was on, so I was watching it, and a Jamaican woman came and sat next to me, and she started cheering for the Knicks. Well, I was from Texas, so I preferred that San Antonio won, so we started going back and forth and had a good time, and the Spurs won, so I was very happy. And um, she, we started talking, and she told me that she was a scuba instructor at the resort where I was staying. And I just thought, wow, what an incredibly exotic thing. What a cool job. And she. Uh, we talked later, and she asked what I did, and I said, well, I'm a biology professor, and I'm very interested in ecology. And she asked me, have you ever been scuba diving before? I said, well, of course not. That's totally dangerous. I would never do anything that crazy. And she says, well, here at the resort, we have a free lesson. And if you show up tomorrow morning, we can teach you how to scuba dive, and you can try it. And then she says, I'm sure I'll see you there in the morning. And at that point, my eyes got about this big in total panic, because I'm thinking, scuba diving? You've got to be absolutely crazy, right? I'm not a fish. I can't breathe underwater. Um, and I don't know. Uh, most of what I know about the world uh, comes from watching American TVs and movies. And so all that I knew about scuba diving is every diver has a giant knife that they carried around on their legs. And they usually use that to cut the hoses, air hoses of other divers. I don't know why. And <laughs> what was one of the most popular movies in the 1970s? Jaws, exactly. So we know the ocean is filled of sharks swimming around looking for a snack. So the rational part of me said, scuba diving, no way, not going to do it. But somewhere deep, deep inside was a voice that said, you know, Mark, this might be fun. Why don't you give it a try? So I told her, OK, I'll see you tomorrow morning. And I remember that I didn't sleep a wink that night. I was completely nervous and completely scared. And I tried really, really hard to find an excuse not to have to do it. <coughs> but I, I never got sick. I felt perfect the next morning. So I showed up for the lessons. And before long, I'm on the boat. And we're headed out to sea. And then there comes that great moment of truth. And so you get, you've got all the gear on. And you stand up out of the boat. And you have to walk to the edge of the boat in your fins. and you're sure you're going to you're sure you're going to die really and so you're checking do you have air <sighs> and you finally get to the edge of the boat and there comes that moment of truth you have two choices then you can go sit back down and face total humiliation for the rest of your life <laughs> or you can jump into the ocean for sure death and it was hard to know what to do so i'm standing there which should, which should you choose I did it. I jumped. Thank you. I took the step. And the way you enter the water is called the giant stride entry. And I stepped into the water and experienced what it was like underneath the sea for the first time. Now, don't worry. I survived. No, no one attacked me with their dive knives. Didn't see a single shark. But instead, what I saw were beautiful tropical fish, brightly colored, uh, amazing colors. I saw a sea turtle. And I also saw one of my favorite creatures, which is a seahorse. And I felt like I was living in a nature show. And I remember, as I'm climbing back onto the boat, I said, I think this is going to be my new favorite thing to do. And it continues to be that until today. So as soon as I got back to Texas, I went down to the scuba shop and signed up for the lessons to become a certified diver. 
And I enjoyed diving so much that I went on to become a scuba instructor. And now I've helped uh, several hundred students learn how to take the giant stride so they can get in the water. And so I became obsessed by learning more about marine biology. And I know as a teacher that the best way to learn more is to be able to teach about it. So I trained myself about marine biology, and I was ultimately able to teach classes. I took students from Texas Tech University, first to Jamaica and later to Belize to learn marine biology. And for six summers, I worked as a marine biology instructor and a scuba instructor on a sailboat in the Caribbean Sea. And that was really pretty good times, and I spent hours and hours of underwater learning more and more about what was happening down there. But what I noticed is you can't spend all of your time underwater. Sometimes you have to come back up on shore. And I started noticing that there was really interesting lives going on of the people that live on these tropical islands where I was visiting. And I started thinking I needed to learn more and more about their lives. And so um, I started choosing my trips where I traveled, not only based on what I might see underwater, but also including what I might see above water. And the first trip I took like that was to the Pacific island called Yap. Yap is a small island in the Federated States of Micronesia. And um, it took about 24 hours and I think four changes of flights to get from Texas to Yap. And I can see a lot of you have probably had long plane flights, so you know what you feel like when you get off the plane and you're jet lagged. So I get off of the little tiny airport in Yap, and a local woman comes and puts the lei around my neck and gives me a little kiss. Now that's not unusual because that's the sort of traditional greeting in Hawaii, but wasn't, what was unusual is that this woman didn't have a shirt on. She was topless. And I can guarantee you in Texas, it was rare for topless women to come give me a kiss. It's, <laughs> it's not happened yet in Hong Kong. Should I be expecting that? <laughs> right? So um, it turns out in Yap, it is OK for women to show their breasts. It's obscene for women to show their legs. So all the skirts have to be below, this, uh, be, be below their knees. And so while I was in Yap, I was able to visit some traditional villages where people were still living very uh, traditional lifestyle. A little bit of simple farming, uh, gathering food, relying heavily on fishing. And I realized after spending so much time trying to learn what's underwater and did everything I could to get underwater, I realized that the real life that I needed to learn more about was happening on land. And so um, I needed to get off the boat, get back on solid land, and start dealing with real, real people again. So in 2010, I had a Fulbright Fellowship to spend one year in Malaysia. Fulbright is a program sponsored by the US government, and it's basically an exchange program for professors. So for one year in Malaysia, I was a visiting professor at the University of Malaya in Kuala Lumpur. So I taught classes on biodiversity there, and my project was in environmental education. So that was a great ex uh, excuse for me to travel around Malaysia, diving in different places, exploring the rainforest. And I also used uh, Kuala Lumpur as a base to travel around um, Southeast Asia. It was a wonderful, wonderful experience. And what I realized is as I stayed there for 11 months, almost one year. After one year, I still didn't understand what was really happening in Malaysia. And I realized that if I wanted to know more, I would actually have to move somewhere new and become a permanent resident. And that's how I've ended up here in Hong Kong. Last summer, I quit a job I'd worked in for 24 years. I sold my house, got rid of most of my stuff. I got married. I moved halfway across the world and started a new job. And if anybody ever tells you doing all of those things in a two months span is probably not a good idea, you should listen to them because it was rough. But I survived and I'm here. And every day is a new adventure. And I wake up every morning saying, man, I cannot believe I live in Hong Kong. And usually I say that in a good way. And, um, but in reality, the fact that I have a fun and interesting life probably isn't that important because I'm already a huge winner in the global lottery. I was born in southern Texas, not far from the Rio Grande. The Rio Grande is the river that forms the border between Texas, the United States, and Mexico. Because my parents lived, and I was born to the north of the river, I was born in the United States, so I'm an American citizen, and I carry all the benefits that entails. I know there were many people who shared my day of birth 
but were born on the southern side of the river in Mexico, and their lives have not turned out um, to be nearly the same as mine. Because I was interested in coral reefs, and coral reefs require warm water, coral reefs are mostly in the tropics, so most of my traveling has been in the tropics. And the tropical environments are fascinating. The um, extremely warm temperatures and high precipitation makes tropical environments the most productive and the most diverse on the planet. For example, a tropical rainforest cover only 7% of the Earth's surface, but half of all species of animals and plants are found living there. So for a biologist, traveling in the tropics is a dream. And you might think that if there's so much life, that the tropics are a great place for people to live. And before I started traveling, I sort of envisioned the tropics as being this little garden of Eden where fruit is falling from the trees into your baskets and fish were jumping into your boats and life was quite simple. And it turns out that life in the tropics is not so idyllic. There's many problems that face the tropical regions, uh, tr uh, tropical diseases, there's been huge increase in population sizes. Uh, that's led to habitat destruction and over-harvesting, and that's placed real challenges on the lives of people living in tropical regions. There's always been a disparity in the quality of life between the temperate zone and the tropical regions, and that disparity, unfortunately, is increasing over time. The increase in human populations in the tropical regions has also had negative effects on the environment. So the reef where I drove for the first time in Jamaica, that turns out to be one of the most damaged reefs in the world. In the late 1970s, the percent cover of live coral in the Caribbean Sea on average was over 55%. That means 55% of the ground was covered by living coral. When I took my first dive in 1999, that number had already decreased down to 15%, and today that number is less than 10%. I feel really cheated that I never got to see the Caribbean Sea at its finest. Now, I've been very fortunate to dive on some reefs in the Pacific Ocean and in the Indian Ocean where the cover of coral is virtually 100% and there's vibrant, intact fish uh, lives. But the great concern that we're going to lose those. Many scientists are, are confident that the um, coral reefs will be gone are quite different in the next 50 years. And that's mostly caused by factors related to increasing the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, uh, global warming, and ocean acidification. Humans have also had similarly adverse effects on uh, terrestrial ecosystems as well. Let me get my facts right here. In the island of Borneo, which is an island shared by Malaysia and Indonesia, in 1985, three quarters of the island was covered by undisturbed primary rainforest. By 2020, it's estimated that only one third of the island will be uh, forested. In Kalimantan, which is the Indonesian part of Borneo, in a 15 year period, 56% of the forest was cut. That's an area the size of Belgium, and that's the equivalent of an area of 27 times the area of Hong Kong. So life in the tropics is hard, and we've uh, been rough on the tropics. And what I've realized in my travels is we live in a very complicated, interconnected world. Today we have technology that can do incredible harm to the environment, but also has the potential to do uh, unprecedented good. Um, we, we, um, we have larger populations demanding more resources from the environment than ever before, and yet we're surprised when our environmental systems and our social systems break down. So I think that now is a time we need bold action more than ever before because our way of life now is unsustainable. We can't keep doing what we're doing. We have to find a better path. And that means we have to make new choices. And that means we're going to have to become uncomfortable. So what I see today is that making bold choices are those that expose you to new ways of thinking. You'll have to be get to know new people. You might know people that speak different languages, people that come from different countries, people who worship different gods, and then maybe they even cheer for a different sports team. Um, bold decisions today will be the ones that recognize that some of us, either through good luck or hard work, have become more successful than others. And we should feel obligated to make decisions 
that increase the quality of life of those less fortunate than us. And that can be people that are refugees halfway across the world. It could be your neighbor down the street, and it could be the hallmate sitting next to you in the room next to you in the hostels. Bold decisions that we're making today will be those that um, might consider how our actions are having the effect on an ecosystem halfway across the planet or on an organism that we never expect to see. So I urge you all to think about making bold decisions. And that doesn't mean that you have to um, start up a new company. That doesn't mean that you have to write a novel. That doesn't mean you have to sail by yourself from Hong Kong to Australia. All of those will be great things. And we've heard fantastic stories about people who have done that today. But people that have uh, these bold actions don't happen overnight. They start with small steps. So what I encourage you to do is look around in your world when, for opportunities to make meaningful, bold steps. When you see the opportunity, take it. It doesn't have to be a big step. Baby bold steps can be quite important. I took one step off the back of the dive boat, I discovered a new passion, and now I've ended up in Hong Kong. Um, so what I urge you to do is look for the bold steps. And I think what you'll find is after you take the first bold step, the second step is easier, and it gets easier and easier over time. And if you keep making the bold choice, you'll be surprised where that path might take you. And even more importantly, you'll be surprised where you might be able to lead the rest of us. So thank you and good luck.